Good morning, everyone. I'm Divya Bhatt, Vice President of Product and Engineering at Verta Health, and I'd like to welcome you to day three of our Beyond Telemedicine Conference. Today, I'll be introducing our session on artificial intelligence and machine learning. When you ask anyone about the potential of virtual care, you'll likely hear an answer that puts AI and machine learning right at the center. However, for all its promise, we're still in the early days of recognizing its potential, and we still have a lot to learn to realize the true impact. We've invited several national leaders and experts in healthcare technology to discuss this important topic. In this session, you'll hear from our amazing panelists. We have Jacob Ryder, CEO at the Alliance for Better Health and the former Deputy National Coordinator for Health IT, Patty Padmanabhan, founder and CEO of Demo Consulting, David Brailer, former U.S. National Coordinator of Health Information Technology, Michael McCullough, entrepreneur and residence at Greylock, John Glasser, former CEO of Siemens Healthcare Services, and finally, Ashima Gupta, Director of Google Cloud Healthcare. Here's a roadmap of the topics we're going to explore. How is AI technology being used in healthcare today? What healthcare companies are already using AI? How can traditional health systems and providers implement these technologies? And lastly, how can we pull from non-traditional forms of data to supplement patient care? I hope you enjoy the panel. The current state of artificial intelligence and machine learning in healthcare. How is AI technology being used in healthcare today? One of the things that AI does is extraction of structure. Another thing that AI does is, is sort of enable contextual awareness. So the machine says, I know who you are, and I know what you're trying to do. Uh, and I know I'm a, if you're a clinician who you're trying to take care of. And I'm going to arrange the data such that we focus you cognitively and reduce steps and clicks. Uh, so I'm aware of you and I'm providing the right context. It's not just a doctor. I mean, it could be a patient. You know, I'm aware of your language preference. I'm aware of your reading level. I'm aware of your diseases, et cetera. So anyway, the second area is contextual awareness. And then last but not least, AI being used to help with clinical decisions. And these are decisions that might say, I think this is the diagnosis or this is a decision that says, I'm predicting uh, that we're going to have trouble with Mrs. Smith here if we don't do something. So anyway, it's very broad in what it do, and it gets diffused into lots of different things. So we'll see AI everywhere uh, in telehealth surrounding this, this sort of relaxation of time and space. And it'll be multifaceted, just as AI is multifaceted, both in healthcare, but also in products such as cars or in areas such as financial services and retail. So I think AI uh, has a lot of opportunity in, in domains, and I, 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 I like to characterize the domains with letters. So there's a little alliteration here. Um, and I think in, uh, of the AI as um, proactive and personalized. So, so if we think of AI as empowering two components of what the ideal health system would provide, and notice I didn't say health care, I said health. Um, because there are things that we traditionally associate with care that may enhance health, um, but may not. And there are things that traditionally we don't as associate with care, such as um, coaching somebody to, to, um, to a better nutrition, right? That may or may not be care because um, we may get it from our, our uh, physical therapist or you know, our next door neighbor or someone's blog. Um, and in many cases, those channels are appropriate. So AI could certainly help us um, in the domains of, of being proactive, which means um, anticipating a consumer's needs, much in the same way that you know, uh, Google and other um, ad-heavy organizations understand who we are, right? They have a persona for who we are. Um, and then they, they predict what it is that we will be interested in and expose us to those opportunities. And so one could argue in the advertising world that that could be you know, for good or evil. And I think in, in health, uh, the, there would need to be sort of binding ethics that align organizations that are incorporating AI in this way um, with the best interests of the individual, because we could use this in other ways, and perhaps we'll talk about that in, other, in a couple of minutes. Um, uh, but for good, if we focus on using AI for good, we can, we can be proactive and anticipate needs. Um, we can also be personalized and understand that this individual may have different needs from that individual based on 
either genetics or demographics or geography or you know one of you know many hundreds of of factors so no human can put all of these things together um, but ai can which specific healthcare companies are already using ai so you see innovative work and AI in the, on the part of very sophisticated uh, and high performance equipment, such as MRIs, such as laboratory equipment. So you see it there. You see AI in the realm of digital diagnostics and digital therapeutics, you know, in Babylon is an example of a company doing exceptional work, uh, but they're not, I mean, hundreds of companies doing work here. You see AI in the contextual awareness setting. So you see it, uh, in, for example, in Amazon, you see it in the EHR systems of Cerner and Epic and others. You see it in wraparound systems that are being placed on top of the EHR, such as companies by Wellsheet, Transformative, et cetera, that make the user interaction easier and simpler and quicker. You see AI being applied in the pharmaceutical companies, J&J, &J, GSK, uh, Roche, and others, as they look for patterns in EHR and claims data to identify whether their treatment's really having the desired effects or whether they're actually picking up early signals of trouble uh, that are occurring there. You see AI on the part of the health plans, you know, Anthem and Optum, et cetera, looking at patterns in the claims data to do more predict better predictive analysis of who's going to need help, et cetera. So a long-winded way of saying, you know, and then you throw in Livongo and you throw in, uh, you know, providers such as Ascension and UPMC and, and a variety of others. Um, and you see some very sophisticated work here. Now, a lot of this work isn't sort of sort of uh, basic, basic research into AI that you might find at MIT or Carnegie Mellon or in the hollowed halls of IBM or Microsoft and Google, et cetera. Uh, this is really the, the work that is done in the application of these technologies to make this incredible range of things that can be done to make them smarter, more effective and safer. So heart disease is the number one killer of our species in America and developed countries, even in worse scenarios like India, Half of men, the first presenting symptom of heart disease is sudden cardiac arrest. Heart flow is essentially a machine learning AI based algorithm out of a PhD thesis from a quarter century ago from a guy named uh, Charlie Taylor, who worked in the Department of Vascular Surgery as one of their main efforts and had philanthropy and a government mixed for uh, tens of millions of dollars to develop the knowledge that the arteries change shape depending on the uh, pressure gradients within the artery. So if you knew a lot about the fluid dynamics of the artery and looking into the wall of the vessel to understand the plaque itself, you could non-invasively take a CT scan, which now is low radiation enough as of about 10 years ago in the US and five years ago in Africa and India, and um, in a sub-millimeter type way, image the entire artery and determine its risk along every artery for a clot forming in that area of that artery. And in clinical use, in the last three years, the specificity and sensitivity of that technology is in the high 90s compared to a treadmill, which is in, in the 50s and 60s, or a echocardiogram or a, a PET scan. So, uh, and the more scans they get, they have about 80,000 scans, they're finding traits which no one ever thought would predict a heart attack, which actually do. How large health systems are implementing technology amid COVID-19? How can traditional health systems and providers implement these technologies? What I've seen is that the penetration of AI is, has been selective in healthcare. So right now we are in the very, very early stages of turning on and making virtual care platforms work. In, in my firm, we use a digital maturity model, which, uh, which is a four stage model. And uh, we look at health systems. We try to figure out where they are based on the attributes of each model. So in, in model one, for instance, you know, you're really looking at your electronic health record system. And I'm talking about you know, providers in, the, in this context. You look at your electronic health record system and whatever functionalities you're able to get out of the EHR system, that forms your digital strategy, right? So whether it's video console, whether it is, uh, you know, your my chart in the case of Epic uh, for patient communication, scheduling, and a whole host of other things, that becomes your strategy. But the next level when you talk about experiences is that you realize that, you know, while the EHR platforms are great, uh, they don't, you know, they're not meant to be everything for everyone. But there's very few health systems today that are in, in that model, which is model four in our uh, 
in our maturity model where they're taking a holistic view, committing themselves to a multi-year, multi-phase digital transformation program, setting aside the budgets for it and getting organizational support. So that is going to happen eventually to everyone, but that's kind of still in early stages. Well, for many health systems, COVID has actually accelerated uh, digital transformation and has made it a priority sooner than they thought it would be. A great example of this is uh, telehealth and uh, virtual concepts, but they're still not at a place where they can you know, commit themselves to a large scale enterprise transformation because most health systems are just not there from a financial appetite standpoint. And COVID-19 in, in many ways has actually increased the financial distress for many health systems. And so they have to be very selective about where they invest. So they're investing in things that they know are essential for them to survive and to continue to serve their patients, such as telehealth. Amid the COVID-19 pandemic, can health systems and providers afford to invest in these types of technologies? The net effect of COVID and the recession that we are in and that I think is expanding and we will begin to see the full depths of over the next several months uh, are quite harmful and disadvantageous to providers. They have now had idle capacity with full employment, largely, uh, and full costs uh, for months. They have borne the cost of the surge and the protection and the preparations for COVID patients. Uh, they have had significant impacts in their general economy around them in terms of just what the business activity that supports many public health systems. And they're about to go into a world where tens of millions of Americans will be without insurance on Medicaid or Obamacare or no insurance, uh, which means that the share of charity care that is being expended by uh, health systems will become potentially uh, uh, unprecedentedly large. So I don't think this is a time to put any further pressure on hospitals and health systems. Uh, I think they've got enormous pressure and in fact our challenge is to help them see their way through the other side towards the through the austerity that we're going to be going through. But I do think that the support that the public brings should come with an ongoing push for transforming the way care is delivered. This should not slow down value-based payment. This should not slow down value-based care or accountable care or a transition to a more streaming patient experience. It should accelerate it. But we have to be very gentle with how we do this given the fragile nature that we'll see our provider capacity being in in the next several months. For those health systems and provider groups looking to invest in telehealth technology, where's the best place to start? If the organization and the CEO are very, very serious about digital health, it would behoove them to uh, create a chief digital officer role, uh, preferably one that's, uh, at least in the example of the Cleveland Clinic, which is a physician-led organization, uh, that that chief digital officer ought to be a physician. Um, and that position, in my opinion, uh, is a direct report to the CEO or a member of the uh, highest level of executive team that the organization has. Uh, but that would be my recommendation is that uh, a very high level executive uh, is responsible for overseeing uh, and energizing the digital health programs. I don't think that is a position that should exist forever. Uh, I think eventually when uh, digital health is robust in an organization and has really been fully transformed into just what is now care, uh, that position can sunset. Um, but I think to really get things transformed in the organization, you need uh, someone uh, at that level and the CEO paying a lot of scrutiny to the transformation uh, in place. A dedicated team is very important uh, and that is likely going to include a, a dedicated team of providers um, to uh, energize um, some of the digital health efforts. So a good uh, toe in the water or camel's nose under the tent way to start is with on-demand urgent care or, or uh, online urgent care for your patients or new patients to your organization. Uh, and this becomes a test bed for the technology and your integration work, uh, gives access to the organization for potentially new patients to your organization. Hopefully you can create some stickiness there and some downstream in-person uh, visits when uh, you need to. And from there, then that can become your uh, foundational bed for uh, more specialty type visits to occur in a virtual visit fashion, um, and then to expand into the remote patient monitoring uh, areas. 
And then if you're going to create new programs like chronic disease management programs, I would recommend having a pro full-time program manager de dedicated to these efforts uh, who can really uh, troubleshoot the systems, uh, envision the systems, help build out the technical links and structures that are needed to be there. Uh, you may also wish to consider uh, digital health support desks. Uh, so this is a, a concept uh, that would be very akin to the Apple Genius Bar. Uh, these would be support desks that are available for both patients uh, and providers in your organization. Uh, places where patients can go to get help with getting set up on the digital health journey, uh, download the appropriate app or apps, perhaps have a test visit uh, with a uh, super friendly patient facing uh, representative or coach. Uh, a place where they can buy connected devices um, if uh, needed um, uh, based on the program that they are. I think uh, Ochsner Health System uh, in New Orleans has done a really good job with this concept. And if you're interested in that, I'd encourage you to contact them for more information. Using data to predict social determinants of health and inform patient care. How can we pull from non-traditional forms of data to better inform patient care? We have to have an interoperable record to support complex chronic care and advanced fragile patients. We know that. But it's more than that because as we move into a world where care is more based in the home and in the community and from a phone or from other sites that are not traditional hospitals and health systems, for example, a retail site, uh, we have to also recognize that a lot of health actionable information is not considered part of healthcare. For example, the information uh, from your phone about uh, your geolocation, what does that mean for uh, your diet, what restaurants you've been in, the information that we can collect from wearables about physiologic measures, information that could be collected uh, from an app about your state of mind or your functional capacity. Those are not traditional PHI in the sense that they're information that is thought about when we think of the normal form of tests and test results and physical impressions and symptoms but they're equally relevant. And so I think the challenge with interoperability is not just mobilizing data that a hospital or a doctor has, but begin compiling that with the data that tells us about what's going on minute by minute in people's lives that has no home and no owner today and the ability to integrate that. The office that I formed, the Office of the National Coordinator, along with CMS right before the pandemic released new rules to try to push information sharing and to broaden it out but it only spoke to what it was statutorily allowed to, which is PHI. So there's still work to be done, but I think we're heading in the right direction of recognizing that there's a very broad set of health information and health relevant information that we need to manage people as they go through their lives. The challenges that face us in health information technology can be um, broken up into what I call the four A's. And the four A's start with acquire in the upper right hand corner. So we have to acquire data and information and we acquire it from various places. So as I described earlier, um, the first step is either transducing data from an endpoint. And let's say we have a Wi-Fi enabled scale or a blood close, glucose monitor or a, a Wi-Fi enabled uh, blood pressure cuff. Well, this would be very accurate ways for us to transduce data from the universe into our analytics system. And so that's step one. Second day is aggregate. We pull it together and we've got to aggregate it from various sources. And this is a real challenge. Um, so acquire is, is difficult because we, don't, we may or may not have interfaces or rights to get the data or information that we seek. Um, the health, uh, Information Portability and Accountability Act, otherwise known as HIPAA, um, was about sharing information. Many people misinterpret it to say it was about protecting. And yes, it's about protecting. But the key of HIPAA is how do we share information in a way that respects individual security and privacy? After aggregate comes analyze. So we've got to figure out what all of this means. And that's you know the, the domain of analytics uh, products. and certainly of, of AI tools. And the last day, and the most important, and I would offer most difficult, is ACT. And what we need to do, and you know, we've, we've, we've all seen um, organizations that build dashboards, which is what analytics gives us, and turn it into um, 
the summary of the things that need to be done. And that's what the last day is, act. And so, you know, as, as we traverse this circle, the first day, acquire, the second day, aggregate, the third day, analyze, the fourth day, act. Guess what happens after act? We create another turn of the wheel because we do things and by doing things, we are now creating another flow of information and data um, that will go back into the system and help teach us something you know, with the next iteration. So the, there are challenges at, in each of these quadrants and the biggest challenges in health IT are actually at the borders between those quadrants, right? So how do we turn analysis into action? That's really hard. How do we turn action into data? That's really hard. How do we turn data into something that's normalized and aggregatable? That's really hard. And then how do we take that aggregation and do the right analysis to come out with something that's useful and actionable and aligns with better health? Um, that's really hard. So those are where the hard problems are at each of those borders. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. To quickly recap what we heard, as healthcare companies are rapidly moving toward more AI and tech-driven systems, there still remain large implementation questions, as well as financial and structural challenges to be explored. Many health systems are not yet set up to harness the potential of AI. Additionally, many are under enormous financial pressure due to COVID-19. The takeaway here is that we need to be realistic with our expectations and continue to make progress despite the current challenges.